Good afternoon, everyone. Aetna awake again. Volcanic ash advisory extending over Eastern Europe. This follows exactly the uptick signals in John Casey's new book, Upheaval with Increased Volcanism and Earthquakes. Cascadia range going off 1,200 years ago and 200 years ago, both in grand solar minimums. Growing tomatoes at 45 degrees below zero Celsius in Siberia. Australian farmers suddenly starting to enclose their seasonal crops. Even the cherry growers in Tasmania are getting on board for that. Please remember to subscribe to Mini Ice Age Conversations on iTunes and Stitcher Radio to support me there. And also subscribe to Adapt 2030 while you're watching the video. Mount Etna, one of the world's most active volcanoes, was dormant for eight months but just erupted again beginning February 27th. The power of this one was enough to send up a volcanic ash advisory across parts of the Mediterranean extending all the way up into Eastern Europe. Map here for you of Etna on Sicily. The intensity of this should have been making world headlines, but you know, it was just a blip on the radar. And I'm going to bring you right over to Volcano Discovery to take a look at a few of the satellite images here. We're going to go right back into the 1st of March. And you'll notice the ash plume coming off going east. And for reference, I do want you to notice that white trail that's coming out. That's the ash cloud. Moves a little bit on the 3rd. But when we look back at earlier eruptions in 2002, the intensity of the volcanic ash cloud was something exponentially far greater. Yet I wonder why they put the volcanic ash advisory out when it didn't even have this intensity and plume coming out. This is an eruption in 2001. The eruptions in 2002 as well. Look how intense that is and how it fans and spreads. But this current eruption was nothing like that. Yes, there was a lot of lava, eruption noise above the city, but the ash cloud coming out was not as intense as this. So I wonder, what's going on with this news advisory of something so far over to the east where personally, I don't know if that ash could drift that far. But in John Casey's new book, Upheaval, he definitely details signals to look for in increases in volcanism, intensity of volcanism, and earthquakes as we enter into this grand solar minimum as every grand solar minimum through the past is accompanied by large eruptions and huge earthquakes. If we take a look at the Cascadia range, the last amount of major eruptions was during the Dalton minimum. When we go back into circa 1200, we find another whole range of eruptions at that time clustered together, grand solar minimum. When we take a look at the Cascadia earthquakes at 9.0 plus, I'm going to bring you right over to the year 500 where it says fall of Rome. That was the late antique little ice age with the most drastic cooling in the last 1500 years. And the line in the center between the voyage of Columbus and where you are now, that was right in the center of the Maunder minimum. So you can see these grand solar minimums have some effect on the crust of the earth. So you shall, from this point forward, see greater earthquakes in strange places and also more intense volcanic eruptions. And as we advance into this grand solar minimum, our growing zones are actually going to be pushed further south. Not north as the global warming IPCC CO2 crowd claims. It's going to go the opposite direction. We're going to have to move about 300 miles south or do what they're doing in Siberia, growing tomatoes at 45 degrees Celsius below zero. It's a triple enclosed greenhouse. And yes, the Russians are responsible for this with the Japanese putting in play fresh vegetable production in one of the coldest places on the planet. Glimpse inside here for you. The term for this is smart agriculture. And looking at their ROI and their revenue projections going out for five years, where it's located in the demand actually pays for itself in as little as 4.7 years at the break even. And just having a crystal ball into the future, knowing what changes need to come with the agricultural as our Earth's climate cools, Hokkaido Corporation will be a global leader in this particular system of build out operations and engineering. And even though they do have three layers enclosing this growth space, 
They're still able to get a 94% penetration rate of sunlight in there. And these were some of the best photos I could get. And I'm not 100% sure if it's a mix of aeroponics and aquaponics together. I'd really like to talk with them a bit further and see what they have envisioned for the Earth's climate moving. Also, the Japanese are very precise along with Germany in engineering specs. So when you're talking about nitrate concentrations in the food that we eat, they can tune this in so precisely to bring it down to what, 17 to 22 mg per kilogram? And those of you asking me for solutions going forward into this grand solar minimum, here will be a world leader as well. Eisen, he's the one who's been setting up the Sayuri experiment. These are going to be the global leaders. The systems they're putting in play. Now, the farmers in Australia are also using safe houses to protect their seasonal crops due to such changes in the climate. Massive floods, winds, cold, and heat. But the interesting part is how they've said they've scaled it up. Instead of square meters, now they're measuring square hectares. And when we're looking at 2.4 acres per hectare, it's a huge area that they're enclosing in these Canadian super houses. Glimpse inside for you here to see the scale that it's being implemented globally right now. Several countries are starting to pick up on this. Spain's been doing it for such a long time, but you even saw some of the destruction of their indoor growing facilities with the high wind and the ice and the hail this year. It came to the point in Australia that farmers are losing crops for five years in a row and going out of business. And then highlighted in the article was a single storm that dropped four inches of rain in 20 minutes with 60 mile an hour winds and they lost 60% of their field production in minutes. So the solution is we're going to have to start enclosing this as well. There's a lot of capital expenditure in this, but once everything reaches that break even point, the only inputs are going to be the labor and the materials. So the price of the food production should decrease at that time. They're looking for 70% reductions in the amount of water and pesticides used, and they can double the amount that they're getting out of the fields. This is a true solution. And as well, the links we're going to have to go to Tasmania's cherry growers are already far ahead of the wave. They're starting to enclose their cherry crop inside. And I like at the very bottom, it says it gives us the opportunity to produce some of the new crops in places where they have never been produced before. And I do want you to look at opportunity and prospering and thriving and just see the possibilities of everything we need to change for humanity to get through these next 15 years as our weather continually goes out of phase and our planting seasons are upside down and places are cold and there's freezes in the wrong seasons and it's hot in the wrong seasons and natural progressions when things should bloom and when they should not are going to be thrown out of whack as we've seen over these last couple of years. And if there's more volcanic eruptions, and if we do get into something like a Laki or a Mount Tambora or a year without a summer, regardless of what happens, these greenhouse growers will still have so much produce coming out of there. So it's like hail, rain, sleet, volcanic ash, downturn, heat, cold, whatever they still can produce. This is your crystal ball right here. This is what the world needs to transition to starting right now. And not just one farmer in Tasmania, and a grower up in Siberia, we're literally talking on a scale that has never been experienced before. So with that said, my question to you is, where do you see your opportunity? And when you see it, move toward it and grab it and make that your laser point focus and achieve that. You shall survive, prosper, and thrive and be able to take care of other people if you can do that. And in terms of keeping your body healthy, please jump over to GetTheTea.com full range of detox as well as different supplements like Moringa that I personally take. I like the energy boost that it gives me. Olive leaf as well. Talking about the Mediterranean Spanish production, this has been used for thousands of years to boost your immune system. Take a look at what they have that can be specifically tailored for your needs to keep your body functioning perfectly during these times when our immune systems and our nutritional content depleted. And I do thank you for watching. I hope you got something out of the video. And this really is what I see in my head as the way forward. And I'm just trying to share it with you because I have so many subscribers and others writing to me asking me, how do I see the solutions going out? I summed it up right here for you in this video in less than 10 minutes.